there's two ways for me of thinking about a novel. One is it obviously spoke to me personally in a very powerful way. It's really one of the most powerful reading experiences that I've had in my life. And then there's thinking about it in the, you start to sound too much like Harold Bloom and like, it's like your final four bracket or something. Um, but, but as someone who spends a lot of time reading great literature, actually thinking in a pseudo objective way where it ranks. And I think this book belongs with Tolstoy and Flaubert and Proust and Henry James and George Eliot and whoever you put up in that very, very, very top echelon of the greatest novels ever written in the history of this genre. I think that book, I think this book belongs there. Hey everyone. You are listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast in which philosophers, theologians, and literary critics discuss how literary art can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. As always, I am your host, Jennifer Frey. I am an associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina, and I am also a faculty fellow at the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. I would like to thank the IEG for underwriting this podcast. We absolutely could not do this work without their material support, for which we are exceedingly grateful. To learn more about the IEG and the work they do on human flourishing, you can go to their website, ihe.catholic.edu. And to learn more about this podcast, you can go to our website. You can find us at sacredandprofanelove.com. On our website, you will find an archive of all our past episodes and guests, and also a blog where we post news related to the work that we're doing. And you can also follow the podcast on Twitter, where our handle is at eudaimoniapod, and you can find me on Twitter as well. My handle is at Jen Frey, and I'm also on Instagram at Professor S. Frey. In this episode, I am joined by Christopher Beha to discuss a novel that you probably have not read, but you definitely should read as soon as you can, and that is Lucky Pair by Nobel Prize winning Danish author Henrik Pontapaden. I was really thrilled to have Chris on the podcast. He is so well read, and he brings such a wealth of knowledge and insight to this text, and he just has such a generally humane approach to literature. And of course, he's an enormously talented writer himself, and you should obviously check out his work, which you can find at ChristopherBeha.com. We did have a few technical glitches at the end of our conversation, but nothing that gets in the way of the content, just a brief interruption of the flow due to some malfunctioning equipment. But with that caveat in place, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Sacred and Profane Love. I am really excited this morning to be joined by Christopher Beha. He is the author of a memoir, The Whole Five Feet, and the novels Arts and Entertainment and What Happened to Sophie Wilder. His latest novel, The Index of Self-Destructive Acts, was nominated for the 2020 National Book Award, and he is the editor of Harper's Magazine. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you so much. I'm just really excited and thrilled and honored to have you on my podcast. I am a super huge fan of your latest novel, uh, The Index of Self-Destructive Acts, which actually we did an episode on. If I were a better podcaster, I would be able to tell you right now the number of that episode, but I don't remember. (laughs) But it was with (laughs) Janie Smith, and you should definitely, if you're listening, you should definitely check it out. And yeah, so the novel that you chose for this episode is Lucky Pear. Is it Lucky Pear or Lucky Par? I'm saying Pear. Okay, Lucky Pear. We don't know how to pronounce any of this. We've already. Yeah, just so everybody knows. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, We're we're just going to (laughs) butcher these Danish names and everyone is going to have to roll with it. Okay, and the author is Henrik Pantopidin. Is that good? That sounds good. Yeah. Okay, great. We're going with it. Yeah. So as regular listeners know, everybody chooses their own book for this podcast. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you, Chris, is why you chose this novel, which I had never read before, and that I did, by the way, really enjoy very much and immediately want to read again. I only have been through it once. It's very long. It's like 600 pages. Uh, but why did you choose this novel? So 
there's there's sort of two answers. The first, because as you know, when you emailed me inviting me to do this, I actually said to you that I just finished this book. And while I was reading it, I had this thought, if I ever go on Jen's podcast, this is the book I want to discuss. And the reason for that is, um, so the title is Lucky Pair. Um, in Danish, which neither of us know, um, it, it's it's like pair, I think, which is um, a word like glick in German that means lucky, but also happy. And I also think it has a resonance of um, success. I think maybe a slightly different, I think it's the same word plus an S on it, it means success or successful. But in any case, the, 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 the term has this resonance of sort of flourishing and happiness and this is one of the major concerns of the book is uh essentially eudaimonia is uh, what it means to be happy in what happiness consists is it just um meeting your own personal needs or is there something larger about happiness is happiness the thing towards which our life ought to be directed is that even like a proper goal for us to have those are major questions uh, in the book. And it just seemed as I was reading, I was like, oh, this is, uh, it's the kind of book while you're reading, you want to talk with someone about it. And we don't, we don't know each other. Um, I listened to your podcast with Jamie about my book, which I was really gratified by. And it got me listening to some of the other episodes of the podcast. I love your podcast. And I thought, you know, she would be a great person to, to talk about this book with. Um, so that's the short answer. And then the longer version is this, and, and, and I can sort of situate listeners a little bit with this version. So Pontobodon was born in the 1850s. He lived a long life into the 1940s, and he was quite prolific. But this book is his major work, I think, and it was published in installments from 1898 to 1904. And it was a huge, huge stir in Denmark and remains a major, major Danish novel. It was quickly translated into German. Thomas Mann admired it. George Lukács talked about it in uh, The Theory of the Novel, which is his great sort of monograph on the novel and modernity as sort of the quintessential of his moment that that book came out around the same time of that moment, the quintessential contemporary novel. And Pantobadan won the Nobel Prize it almost always went to Scandinavians then, so it wasn't quite the same achievement. But, you know, some of them were very deserving. It went to, you know, Sigurd Inset won it and Knut Thompson. And, and then the book was never translated into English uh, for 100 years. Ten years ago, this translation by Naomi Leibowitz was published in an academic press edition that was like almost like a library edition that I think cost like 80 bucks or something like that. At the time, Frederick Jameson wrote something about it in the LRB, but it didn't, it wasn't a great literary moment that this sort of modernist classic was finally making its way into English. Then a few years later, there was a second translation published. Uh, and again, there wasn't a huge stir. And then just a couple of years ago, this, this Leibowitz translation, which we're talking about, was published in a trade hardcover edition by Modern Library. And um, that's when I bought the book, I think based on reading a James Wood review of it. And it came out right around the time that my second child was born. So I, 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 it sat on my shelf for a long time. And then I picked it up a few months ago and I just, my, my jaw dropped. There's two ways for me of thinking about a novel. One is there, it obviously spoke to me personally in a very powerful way. It's really one of the most powerful reading experiences that I've had in my life. And then there's thinking about it in the, you start to sound too much like Harold Bloom and like, it's like, your final four bracket or something. Um, but, but as someone who spends a lot of time reading great literature, actually thinking in a pseudo objective way where it ranks. And I think this book belongs with Tolstoy and Flaubert and Proust and Henry James and George Eliot and whoever you put up in that very, very, very top echelon of the greatest novels ever written in the history of this genre. I think that book, I think this book belongs there. Yeah, I mean, I, I I did love this novel, by the way. And I also, one of the things that I've realized in the past year is that Danish literature is amazing. 
this <laughs> one in 19th century Danish literature is just off the charts. I had no idea. And I would have no idea, frankly, if Morten Hoy Jensen hadn't contacted me out of the blue and was like, hey, I think you should... <laughs> I think you should be on to this, and uh, and he was exactly right. So when the when, when the other translation uh, came out a few years ago, Morton wrote an essay about this book for the New York Review, and you know when, I know I, I listened to your podcast with him talking about Niels Lina, and and uh, which is a book I, I I I admire a great deal as well. And you guys talked about this. Why don't people know this book? That's so great. Um, in certain ways, I think it, it's an even odder case with Pontobedon because he lived much longer. He did get that level of praise in his own lifetime. You know, he was a major international literary figure who won the Nobel Prize, and the book was never even translated. I mean, it's baffling to me, but but I wish, you know, I hope now people will say this 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 ought to be in the canon for sure. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly don't have an interesting story about why this has been overlooked because it is sort of, I mean, it has it has all the all the hallmark all the hallmarks of classic modern literature, and it really is just the struggle of a soul, right, to try to try to navigate life, to try to figure itself out, to try to figure out what what the goal is, what the struggle is about, what's it for. And of course, it's very interesting to me as a philosopher because it has all of these 19th century philosophical influences and theological influences. You know, there's there's like some Kierkegaard and some Nietzsche and, you know, some some Darwin. And there, there, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff going on, but it's really just it, it's it's such a good case study of well, from my perspective of how someone who is so desperate to be free in the sense of I've got to be free from these constraints that are burdening this act of self-creation that is my life, right? That are like holding me back from expressing like my full potential or something. And, And in the end, right, he can't escape it at all. Right. In the, in the end, I think, well, this is something that we'll talk about, but in the end, I think he, I think he ends up exactly like his dad, (laughs) who is this one figure, this, this, this towering figure, you know, that he is running from the entire time he's running from his father. There is a possible reading of this, that what he has managed to do is, um, uh, broken the chain. The, that 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 he winds up like his dad, but his son will not wind up like him. That is one. That's one. That's one possible reading. Yeah. Of well, it. let's let's come back to that. Obviously, we're going to. I mean, just so everybody knows, uh, there's going to be massive spoilers here. So if you want to stop everything and just go read the novel, um, please do that, and then check back in when you're done. <laughs> yeah. And. I would say about that. Uh, I mean, one, do read. The, I, I basically, I've, I've made my feelings on the novel already clear. But anyone who is who is interested in your work, who listens to this podcast, who's interested in thinking about literature in the way that you do on this podcast, I think even if they don't have the uh, quite the response that I do, is going to get a lot out of this novel. So they don't need to listen to the next hour before deciding whether or not to. That's take right. That just plunge. just do it. Okay, so let's just do it also. So so let's let's get right. into our story about Pear. Um, so let's just talk about, you know, where he's from and what his family is like and what his father is like since his father is this driving force in his life, whether he wants him to be or not. Right. So so Pear is um, born in sort of provincial Denmark in Jutland. Um and he is from this, he's a middle child of a very large family of, I think, 10 or 11. And growing up, he is Peter Andreas uh, Sidenius. Um, and the Sidenius's are a long line of Protestant ministers in the uh, sort of establishment Danish church. And it very explicitly says that the Sidenius line of ministers goes back to the Reformation. So they are this type of the 
the provincial Northern European, Protestant European uh, minister's family. That's kind of the family business in a certain way. Such that, so much so that when he goes, when he eventually makes it to Copenhagen and, and, and tells people his name, they say, oh, you're from the, the ministers. You're, you're, it's, that, it's that closely identified. And it's mentioned very early that among the, the line of these Sidenius ministers is a figure who is sort of known as Mad Sidenius, who I think struck the choir master at a tavern or something. But, but he, he's sort of like a black mark on the, on the family. Um, his, his father is a particular kind of sort of pietistic minister who is not particularly well-loved by his parishioners. There's stories about how he, at funerals, when people want these sort of like um, soaring eulogies that give them hope, he just sort of is like memento mori and, and he's quite dour. His mother is something of an invalid in the way of a, a particular type of woman in a 19th century novel. She mostly takes to her bed for then Peter who will who will later call himself Pear it's it's just a very very stifling atmosphere and he from a very early age there isn't a particular incident or a a particular moment of revelation he just from a very early age uh, rebels against this yeah i mean it's not a very fun household it's a very strict household and i think there's a kind of family asceticism that's enforced or imposed on all the children. And even though they, they're, it's like doing, they're doing things that seem joyful. Like, you know, they're singing hymns like around the fire, mm-hmm. but it also sort of feels like strict <laughs> and, and maybe not so joyful. There's this one line that just made me laugh out loud about the sisters singing. And it was like, oh, well, you know, she she had no impulse to Catholic mysticism. Like it was all very you know, yeah. Yes. You know, you wouldn't want to get carried away with your hymns. And yeah, so I think pietistic is is good. I mean it's Lutheran, right? I mean they they're yeah. I think that is yeah. yeah. So and he is from a very young age, kind of desperate to get away from it, desperate to be different. You know, mm-hmm. he doesn't want to identify yeah. with this family. He doesn't really seem to like anyone in his family. Right. Can I can I read a, just a brief passage Absolutely. on that? There's this early thing where where he meets a young uh, a, a girl from the countryside, um, and he, it's sort of a, a, a Peter denying Christ kind of moment. She says... Um, He's sort of flirting with her, and she says, "Is it true what they say that you are a son of the pastor?" And he he de- he says no. He denies it. And then Pantobadan writes, "He had never known so strongly as in that moment that he did not belong to his house, to that half dark, stuffy room where his father and siblings now sat and sang hymns and muttered apprehensive prayers." in the middle of a magical winter's night, in a sort of underworld blindness to the light and full of a dread of life and its glory. He felt himself a thousand miles from that scene, under a wholly different heaven, at one with the sun and stars and the sailing clouds. And that's sort of the... That's it. He, he, and particularly, he gets into this underworld thing. He wants to be out in the sun. He wants to be in kind of, it's like um, the Nietzschean view of the Mediterranean, of going south to the, you know, he wants to be in the mount, clear mountain air, and he wants to be in direct contact with the sunlight under a different heaven, and they're trolls underground. Yeah, I mean, I think the Nietzschean impulse is definitely in him as well. Uh, it's not his only impulse, and it's not necessarily the prevailing impulse, but it's there. And I think part of it is just this idea that, this Christianity that is imposed on him is this kind of life-hating enterprise. And he he wants to live, right? He wants to be free. He, d- he wants to be free from, yeah, these burdens that he didn't choose. I mean, I think that's, the, that's one of the main problems is that he like – 
Like every other human being just finds himself in a family, in a place that you didn't choose, right? That isn't isn't a work of your will. And I think what what Pear trusts or loves more than anything else is his own will. (laughs) You know? Yes. And he has it, it is it's described sometimes as his motto or his watchword. And it obviously very Nietzsche is just is I will. Yeah, exactly. And Um, so happily for him, uh, he gets out when he's 16, right? Right. He, uh, He, He gets sent to an engineering school in Copenhagen at his request. And there's some sense that the parents understand that it's it does, it's not working for anyone having him there, but they they send him off very much in this se- sort of sending off the the prodigal son and uh, with the prayerful expectation that he will you know come back uh, to the path eventually. Yeah, um, and he goes to engineering school because you know, and this is in 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 a typical I think um, young man from the provinces, buildings Roman. Um, he would want to be an artist or a writer or uh, in Balzac, they're often sort of journalist, uh, but he wants to be an engineer. And in particular, he's already starting to formulate at this stage his great project, which is he has this idea for building a system of canals that will not only unite the Danish provinces to Copenhagen, but will make Denmark itself a more central player in Europe because it will make it a natural trade route in a way that will um, uh, compete with uh, Germany and and um, some of the other Northern European port cities. I mean, I think part of his attraction to this, this kind of practical science of engineering is that he wants to get away from again, you know, his, his dad is more of a contemplative, right? And he, he wants to be a man of action. He wants to be this man of the 20th century. And of course he has this very naive faith in, well, I, in my opinion, (laughs) naive faith (laughs) in, um, in technology, in, in the promise of just this never ending progress towards some sort of better tomorrow through scientific rationalism and technology, like we are no longer going to be backward. So I think there's also this connection between pair, you know, the guy, the person, but also Denmark, you know, the country, like he thinks it's also backward and provincial and needs to like progress needs to like him, you know, get rid of its baggage, um, which is just like holding it's holding it back. And there's also, um, he at this stage, he has no aesthetic sense whatsoever. And that, I think, is important, too. He, he wants to break free of, of uh, this environment that he's come from. And this kind of rationalist, uh, you know, technical mastery of the world is the only sort of legible option because there is there is no philosophical or aesthetic sense. And I think that's also for Pontobodon himself something that is getting played through as this sense that Denmark is sort of intellectually impoverished in a way that there's various um, references to it's either the Middle Ages or the void, or it's the, um, the cross or champagne or things like that, that there should be some kind of third way that is not available to the Danish people because they aren't sufficiently kind of cultivated. Yeah. Well, the third way is hard for people generally, but yeah, I think he, I think he sets up a lot of false dichotomies for himself. You know, that's just sort of a, an extremely common thing that people do. Right. So, so he goes to Copenhagen and he's studying and his dad gets sick. Right. I mean, that sort of seems like the next big thing that happens. I think one of his. Right. So his bro, he has an older brother who's, who's he's, so he goes to Copenhagen and very soon after he goes back for uh, a visit, just, he's a student and he's going home for Christmas and he expects to be kind of embraced like the, the prodigal and um, 
uh, no one has met him at the station and they didn't hold dinner for him. They've already eaten. It's at the table. And he, and so the second time he goes, he goes very much in the spirit of I'm, I'm never coming back. That's it. Um, and, um, he's living in this apartment. Um, he is, um, going to his, his technical school. He's doing some teaching, I think. And, uh, then yeah, his father falls ill and his older brother who is living, uh, in Copenhagen comes to visit him to tell him that he ought to go home and visit his father. Yeah. And I think he doesn't want to go home. Right. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear, but I think he also kind of feels like he's being bullied. You know, I think he sort of feels like they're using his dad's, I think he has cancer at any rate, something is, something is wrong with him. And I think he sort of feels like his dad's sickness and death is kind of being used to not so subtly bully him back into the world of the cross bears, yeah. <laughs> I think is what he calls right. them. There's something else that's going on at this stage too, which I think is worth mentioning, which is I said that he sort of has no aesthetic sense. He falls in just by being in kind of... Um, Copenhagen cafe and pub and restaurant society with the um, literary artistic circles of Copenhagen at the moment, which he describes as a bohemian clique known as the independence consisting of younger and singular older beautiful souls, genuine talents who nevertheless had in some way become stalled, either never really maturing or growing old before their time. And these people are, you know, are kind of the third way, but they are, as it, that passage suggests, um, not doing very well uh, in that uh, in that line. In possibly because there is something about Denmark that uh, is not good enough soil for it. Or, um, but we get introduced at this point just through conversation to a figure named Doctor Nathan who is based on George Brandeis and is going to be a, a sort of major figure here. And there's various, at this point, in a very sort of classic Ramana Clay sort of way, I think Pantobadon is doing the like realist depiction of Copenhagen intellectual circles at this time. And I think that uh, Jakobsen is among the people who is being sort of um, parodied at that yes. point. He's one of yes, the I think he's a poet, you know, who is forever wondering about his grammar or something, or his punctuation. Spend, spends the morning, you know, putting a right. comma in and spends the afternoon taking a right. comma out. Yeah. 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 So, so Dr. Nathan, um, I mean, he's kind of, I mean, does, isn't he called Dr. Satan at some point? What's his, what's his deal? Yes. So he is in exile for, in self exile for, for, the first half of the novel, he's only just sort of referenced, but he is a modernizer. He is in touch with the intellectual currents of, of Europe, including Germany. He's clearly read his Nietzsche and his Schopenhauer and, um, and Hegel and wants Denmark to, to modernize. He's also Jewish. This is going to become Judaism is a, is a major, major subject of the novel. And for this reason, is is suspicious to a lot of people. Per himself has a bit of the sort of homegrown casual anti-Semitism at this point of sort of establishment Denmark, but he is a he is a voice for getting past the um, superstitious uh, stuntedness of you know, traditional Danish culture is Dr. Yeah, Nathan. I mean, I'm, I don't know how much time we'll have to talk about it, but I am really interested in, in sort of how the Jews are treated in this novel. I mean, because the Jews that we meet are, um, they're wealthy, they're intellectual, they're, they're totally assimilated from all that you can tell. Um, they're very cosmopolitan. Um, and yet they're sort of, I don't know. They're, they're sort of still alien figures in, you know, I mean, they, they have, they're not quite, they're not quite accepted 
despite all they've accomplished. And of course, um, Pear falls in love with a Jewish woman. Right. Which is, which is kind of what happens next, right? Like he gets in with the. Right. So there's a, there's, there, there's a, a intermediate stage, which I like, I don't, I don't know how beat by beat we could get, but he, he starts to have a series of, of, of love affairs or pseudo love affairs. He falls in with a young woman who is, um, a model for one of the painters in this circle. And then he has this very Balzacian or uh, Proustian kind of classic relationship with a married society woman who, you know, has a sort of series of lovers and he takes up the role and, and, and he's completely impoverished and, and he can't afford to play this role, but he's, um, and and he winds up, and this is important. He winds up after a night with her, going home with this older uh, sort of dilettante aristocrat who has been her former lover himself, and they have a long conversation. And then in the morning, he discovers that after he left, this this character has taken his own life. Right. And then he later discovers that he has. Um, he has left his estate to pair and it's not enormous, but it's enough to all of a sudden get him out of his troubles. And it is one of those pieces of luck that are the recurring, uh, every time he's just at the end of his rope, some, something like this happens. So that allows him to, to continue on. And, and later this character, uh, this character's sister will become a major figure in part because, because pair, lies about his background he claims he never knew his father and then the sister comes to think that he's actually this man's illegitimate son and that that's why he has left him the estate so she takes this protective role over him that is in fact based on a complete deception so pair then um one of the people he meets in this circle is a character named ivan solomon who is a, a the the son of one of the wealthiest merchants in Copenhagen. He gets involved in the Solomon household and he eventually winds up falling in love with and getting engaged to uh, Ivan's older sister, Jakob. Yeah. And she is definitely one of the most interesting characters in this novel. Um, And she, I, I I mean, there are a bunch of different, scenes where we kind of get a glimpse into her worldview. I mean, she really resents Christianity, which is not yes. surprising. <laughs> um, it's just not at all surprising. And I think she sees Christianity as, you know, self-righteous, as hypocritical, as an oppressive force, something that has to be overcome, something that has clearly done innumerable horrible things to her own people but she also has like this kind of i don't know i mean kind of nietzschean critique of christianity is right she's she is the the great nietzschean force in the book in the sense that she 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 wants to live a, 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 a life affirming life you know and she thinks of christianity as as life uh, negating or life denying. And she is sort of in the building's Roman way, part of her, she, she, she is a, a, a driver of Paris kind of sentimental education in the middle parts of the book. And she has, you know, she, she has been victim of a lot of, I think what we'd now call sort of anti-Semitic microaggressions throughout throughout her life, but she's very wealthy and comfortable and situated in society and insulated from some of these things. But earlier, before the events of the book take place, she'd had this experience where she's traveling in Germany and she's in a train station and she sees these um, Jewish refugees from the pogroms in Russia. Right. And they are really the wretched of the earth. Right. And she recognizes in some way, those are my people. These comfortable European people are not my people. And the reason that we are the wretched is because is because of Christianity, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there are a lot of things going on there for her. 
Um, and, and I think that her, you know, her, her Jewishness, like, like all of her wealth and all of her culture and probably at the end of the day, all of her good works, it can't really inoculate her from other people's perceptions of her Jewishness. Yeah. Yeah. And the wealth, by the way, just to add another turn to it, I'm pretty certain that it was made in the slave trade. There's a mention oh. of how the Solomon grandfather first, and, and it says, you know, he had some, some dealings and trade to the West Indies. Oh. So that's just, I don't, I don't know to what extent that's a point that Pontobidin himself kind of like means to hang a lantern on, but there is even in their case, a bit of this, um, Balzacian behind every great fortune is a great crime. Um, they, they are not, you know, they're, 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 they're implicit in some of this themselves. So, so just to press along, because I, to me, uh, for the first two thirds of this book, it is a wonderful 19th century realist novel, but recognizable as such. And then two thirds of the way through, some really weird stuff starts happening in terms of the shape of the book. And then the last 50 pages, it just becomes a truly, truly strange. They get engaged. Um, Pear is everyone well, kind don't of don't they don't they kind of get like secretly engaged or like they get secretly en- they have an understanding with each other they do get her parents on board with this yeah um, eventually. but it is not announced it is not announced yeah um, everyone understands that the pair needs the rough edges sanded off. Uh, he needs a little bit of refinement, um, uh, you know, a wealthy, um, in the way that Americans did the tour, you know, um, a wealthy Dane like Jacob would have had that as a young lady. She did. She did this tour. Uh, and they kind of decide that Per needs the tour. And also that that's where he's going to learn some of the, 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 the engineering he needs to do his great project. And, and for Per, I think it's part of just his sense of, of, of restlessness and, and kind of homelessness. Mm -hmm. But in any case, he starts to travel through Europe and then, she, he goes to Rome. Pear and Rome. He goes is to really, Rome. It's really funny. <laughs> it is really funny, and it's and and it's it feels almost like a, a parody of certain Henry James novels. Not least because this figure of the protective noblewoman is this classical James uh, trope. But what we eventually discover, and this is the sister of the character who had killed himself, is that she's insane. Yeah. And that kind everybody knows it except for Pear. <laughs> yeah. And he has sort of put his fortunes. He's decided that she's going to adopt him. He's yeah. going to get this noble title. This will help him make his way in society. But yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't do a good job in, in Rome. Yeah. Yeah. But he's also like very impressed. I mean, his his anti-Christianity goes up, you know, several notches, I think, in Rome. It seems like the first time that he becomes aware of classical culture <laughs> right? <laughs> in any way. I yeah. mean, I guess that shouldn't be surprising. I have to, I have to say, and uh, we may be crossing the bounds on this podcast, but I sometimes I, when I, when I read like Kierkegaard or something, I was certain of these Northern European writers who are struggling with this dichotomy. I just think if only they'd had Catholicism. Um, and <laughs> And there's a there's some because what Kierkegaard wanted to be is he wanted to be a monk, but they didn't have those. I know <laughs> they'd, they'd, they'd closed down all the monasteries. So so, yeah. and 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 marriage was the only good life. And what are you going to do? But um, but anyway, this Rome pair in Rome is partly that he's also coming in contact with with that, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, no, you're not crossing any, any lines by just going Catholic on my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so at this point when he's abroad, like the communications between him and his fiance are really interesting, like sort of the things that they reveal about themselves in their letters. And there's this like incredibly comical scene in Rome in the carriage. <laughs> like There's just like, they're like, doing the uh tourist ride in rome and this is the um this is nanny 
Should we talk about yes. her? Yes, Nanny is so Nanny is the younger sister. Ivan and Jakob are actually have a different father than the rest of the family. The father has passed away, and then the mother remarries this rich Solomon uh, merchant. And the mother is from a sort of more sort of cultured German Jewish family. And then Nanny is much more beautiful than Jakob, and is a kind of. Um, I mean, she's a she. She has more of a she. She relishes her role in society, her power over men. Um, she's a flirt, um, and it was his interest in Nanny that originally brought Pear into the family. And then he sort of realizes, no, this the older sister is. And there's a moment after he he shows up all the time, and it's clear that he's courting Nanny. And then he has this moment where it actually there's a chapter that ends with him thinking, can it be that it's Jacob I'm in love yeah. with? Yeah, um, yeah. And he's very sort of put out by the idea in a lot of ways. Yeah. And one thing we should say about Paris, he's incredibly feckless about this stuff, and he's con- and that has to do with his sort of restless heart. He he, so he's in Rome, and all of a sudden he's like, and and Nanny is married by this point, um, and and she's visiting uh, essentially on her honeymoon with the husband, and they enter into this kind of flirtation together, and then later he'll just sort of like, you know, he goes to a dance. And he sees a beautiful woman and he's like, and she's got, she's from a family with millions, you know, and, and, and he's like, hmm, maybe I don't need to marry Jakob. Maybe I need to marry this one, you know? And clearly he is, um, uh, her wealth is part of the appeal. He has these grand projects. He wants to make it uh, in, in society in a particular way. And she has this, this money behind her. And, they, and sometimes he's like, Maybe I could find some way to get this money and not marry a Jew. That right. would be nice, you know. Right. Or like maybe yeah. I could have a beautiful wife and have this money, or you know, those sorts of, you know, his general view on all of this stuff is not uh, particularly admirable. Let's say that. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm really interested in his relationship attraction to Jacob because, like. He's not, I mean, he sort of accidentally gets into her, you know, whereas almost everything else, it's like, he has this ambition, right? I mean, yeah, he has a restless heart, but really he has ambition. Right. And so he's constantly like seeking out the the objects of his ambition, which are really in the end all about him. And then I think he sort of finds himself actually attracted to Jacob, right? Who is actually a deep and interesting person. But but I also think that no matter how close he gets to anyone, he's incapable of, it's like he doesn't have the virtues or he doesn't have the will or he doesn't have the desire or something is holding him back from ever really meaningfully being attached to another person. Yeah. And yes. you can just see it all throughout the book. It's like whenever he really gets close to anyone, he finds some reason to pull away, to pull back, or to run away, or to give up. And uh, there's, some, I mean, there's something there, and I'm not quite sure how to diagnose it, but there's something in him that is holding him back from real intimacy with another person. Yeah. So Jakob, I think, in a way, does represent for him real happiness. You know, he, he, she, she is his opportunity to live the life he claims he wants, which is the life out in the open air, the life in the sunlight, um, the life that is not the underground troll life. You know, she is free. She, her material circumstances make her free, but she's also free from this um, superstitious religious. Danish tradition. She's from this secular Jewish family. Um, she is this sort of Nietzschean. She wants to live the life she wills. And, you know, she has she has the material means again to do it. So, 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 she, and she loves him and she seems to actually understand him. She wants to bring out this potential in him. And so if he wanted a happy life, you know, if the thing that he's been saying from the beginning of the book, which is just that, like, 
this is the life I'm freeing myself for, then Jakob, it does seem like, is that. And he obviously feels an incredible ambivalence about that. Um, but there's a moment. An, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, do you do you think it's an ambivalence about actually being happy or an ambivalence about her being the... But I don't know. That, the way I think to it, happiness. It, 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 I think it's, it's at certain times, it's a bit of both. I, in, in the extent that, I mean, to the, to the extent that the conception he has of what happiness would entail is a right one, then I, then it's an ambivalence about whether or not he actually wants that happiness. I think by the end of the book, we get into, you know, uh, deeper questions about what it would actually mean to live a happy life. But to the, he, the, the life that he has decided would be a happy life, he actually does, there seems to be some part of him that actually rejects. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem like at every point in his life, when he gets to the point where he's about to succeed, right? He's he's about right. to realize his dreams. <laughs> it, we haven't we haven't talked about it yet, but he he's always talking about his dreams, like from the time he was very young, and and about being able to live his dreams or realize his dreams or living in dreams. I mean, it's constantly coming up, but every time he actually comes close, he does something to undermine it. So it's right. not just that it happens to get undermined, like bad luck or something. No, like he, he's right. doing he it. He does it. He does it. He does it. And and in particular, I think, I mean, there's a sense in which in order to succeed within this, if we can be very sort of like sociological about it, in order to succeed within this emerging capitalist society, which is the society within which a plan like this technical canal plan would succeed or fail um uh, you have to you have you have to shape yourself to fit within it and he there's a there's he finds that very constraining when and it's very often what is being asked of him is some very minimal humbling of himself in the way that the this game demands of you, you know, yeah. this person is the person who has the money to fund the plan. You have to go pay your respects to that person. And right. his response is, he wants my plan. He has to pay respects to me. You know, it's like that sort of stuff. He won't in any way compromise uh, within, within that system. Um, in a way that like, it's possible to find noble, you know, it's, uh, um, but the true nobility, right, which which is where we get, is to be unwilling to to humble yourself, knowing that the end result of that is that your plan will never come to fruition, and to will that as the outcome. That would be the truly Nietzschean gesture, is to say, I don't need the plan. Uh, all I need is to be the person who has never humbled myself. Um, but he, but that's, that, that's a very stringent kind of life. And that's where we start to get towards the end, I think. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, right. You, sorry. I mean, you could look at it and just think, well, it's a certain kind of integrity. Like he has to remain true to himself. And so he can't flatter, you know, this merchant or he can't, you know, he can't do this or that. But, but I just sort of wonder if, there's something more subterranean going on. Oh, for sure there is. He really, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's not, he's not a Nietzsche. He's not a Nietzsche. You know, I think Yaakov is. And, 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 and actually yeah. at a certain point we start to, she's probably the most wholly admirable character in the book in a lot of ways, but there is, there are moments where you start to see the darker side of this worldview and her. So there is this sort of, um, you know, uh, venture capitalist who uh, they go to to try and get funding for his project, and he's known for ruining other people. Basically, uh, he 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 want, he crushes his enemies to, in the ground, including people who wind up taking their lives. Suicide is a major major theme in this book, and Pear won't bow himself down, and he expects Jakob to be proud of him for this, and. Um, 
And he sort of says, come on, someone like that when he behaves this way. And she says, well, the world needs more people who behave the way he is. He does, you know, he has the strength to do it. And if a few people get crushed along the way, this is how we're going to bring about this new century, you know. So there are occasional moments where she says some things that um, are a bit startling on that front or are starting to tease out the implications of this sort of Nietzschean, you know, thus I will it viewpoint. Yeah. I mean, I've, I think I told you an email. I've been teaching Nietzsche for the past two weeks. That's just where we are in the semester. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's dark. I mean, th- I mean, you just can't get around the, the, the dark heart, I think of, of Nietzscheanism, which is, y- you know, that, at the end of the day, it actually is all about you. Right. Although it's interesting where that ends up for Jacob. Right. So maybe we should just, maybe we should just keep going yeah. in the narrative arc. So I mean, ba- yeah, so basically, I mean, obviously he's not going to marry her. Right. So it's no surprise to the reader that this this doesn't work out, just like everything else t- doesn't work out. But what happens? So, because that was surprising to me, actually. Right. A first thing that I think is important to, to the story is this. While he is abroad, she comes to visit him and she lies to her parents so that they, and they kind of meet in the Alps and they have uh, this very transformational moment. There's a cross up in the Alps and he, he shoots a gun at the cross and he says, you know, I shoot in the new century. This is a very traumatic moment. And they are together in this sort of like Nietzschean bliss. They are they are uniting in the fact that uh, uh, in their mutual contempt for Christianity, basically. And then that is when they, they consummate their relationship. And she gets pregnant, uh, which yeah. he never finds out. And she doesn't tell him for a number of reasons, but I think partly because by the time she's home, she already sort of knows this relationship is not going to um, to, to last. And the last thing she wants is to tell him and then have him do the selfless thing. And, you know, so, mm-hmm. but they are on the edge of getting married. They're actually sort of like dealing with getting the marriage certificate. And he's just sort of like administratively procrastinating in a way that like they would have been married by now if he'd just handled the paperwork. And then um, his mother dies. Right. And his father has already died. And there, the, the, that, that is itself a kind of scene with the family. But But now his mother dies and he winds up they 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 have after the father's death the whole family has moved to Copenhagen so now her casket is going to be taken by ship you know back to to the provinces where they're from and he's still falling out with his family he will not take the train back with his siblings for the funeral but what he does instead is he rides he gets on the ship and he, and he takes the ship that is a you know a container ship it's not a passenger ship with his mother's casket um, the people who work on the ship are worried that he's going to throw himself off in the middle of the night because he, that's what's why people right. stow away is so that they can kill themselves. Right. And he has and and he has a kind of conversion moment in this process. And then he he when he gets off the ship, he doesn't go home. He goes instead to the town where this. Um, uh, this noble woman has wound up with her sister and the sister's husband, who was a big landowner there. And then this is when the, the, the novel just takes this weird right turn where the next, the last 150, 200 pages of the novel take place in this completely different world than the rest of the book. And that world. Yeah. And he starts, he starts a completely different yes. life. Right. And that world includes this this figure, Pastor Blumberg, um, who is um, basically a kind of like uh, modern, progressive, rationalist Christian pastor. He is very much a Christian, but he's a Christian on the sort of humanitarian grounds. And um, he is not at all of the dour sort of the Sidenius line. And he is a figure of a, a, a fair amount of sort of fun or humor in, in, in the book. But he he does, he is part of Pear's um, turn back to Christianity. And eventually Pear falls in love with 
his daughter. So how, uh, yeah, I have a question for you. So how much do you see his turn to a different kind of Christianity, of a kind of liberal, enlightened Protestantism, and also his, you know, that the scene on the the scene on the boat where he sort of realizes that he's been living in the wrong way somehow, that he's been ungrateful almost, or that he, he, he sort of like made this project of self-consciously forgetting who he was and, and it was bad. Like how much of that is tied up with rejecting Jacob? Like, I just sort of feel like you can't really understand this turn without seeing it as a turn away from her. Right. So, so I, I, here's where I come out on that, right? To me, one of the, the, the main concerns of the novel, which, you know, is important very much for historically where it's situated is this, the Nietzschean story is, is, is essentially, we are a race of, of strong animals that were sort of made to live instinctively and be at home in this world and we have been sickened by this slave morality that has taught us to be slaves because that it is about the weak wanting to control the strong by creating this set of these debts and obligations and all you need to do is shuck that off and live your live your full sort of actualized life and that option is what Jakob represents in a lot of ways, right? And the question becomes, what happens if you shuck it off and you still feel broken? Right. And you still feel restless um, and you still feel like you're a pilgrim in this world. You, you don't feel like it, the, the, the world is your home. And what happens if what you have shucked off is, in fact, the only promise for a home that you might have in that condition? Now, there's a couple of different things you could say in response to that. One of them is, well, that's because you were so poisoned that you can't really shuck it off. Right. And I yeah, actually you're weak. think that yeah. is, you're weak, but all, not just that, but, but you, you have been, you have so internalized the slave morality, you have so internalized the life negating sickness that you can actually allow yourself to do the thing that you have it in your power to do. And I think that's what Jacob would say is Per's problem. You know, he's still, and Per often still says, if only I weren't a Sidenius, if only I didn't have this Sidenius troll blood in me, you know? Right. And that is one of the possibilities, you know? But obviously, you know, I think the on a metaphysical level, that's neither of us would embrace that possibility, but I also don't think that's the possibility that the book winds up kind of embracing, but it is, it, it is, you know, I, I went back and read James Wood's review of this book uh, before. Yeah. Talking, so uh, did I. Yeah. He's such a good critic. Uh, he is himself the son of a minister and he seems so offended really by the turn this book takes at the end. And we should <laughs> yeah, say, because we are it. running out of time. I do, I do, I do want to get to what actually happens because he yeah. does not remain a Christian. So he breaks it off with Jakob. He marries Pastor Blumberg's uh, wife. Time starts to move very quickly. All of a no, sudden, no, within, he marries, you know, sorry, we, sorry. He marries his daughter. Sorry, Pastor Blumberg's daughter. He <laughs> marries the daughter. Yes, he does not marry the wife. That's important. He marries the daughter and he starts, you know, he gives up on his big canal project. He works doing local engineering uh, things. Time moves very quickly. All of a sudden, within a couple of pages, he's got several children. And there is this, basically, he eventually winds up walking away from this marriage in a very Kierkegaardian way, the way that Kierkegaard broke off his engagement. When he breaks it off with Jakob, he thinks, well, you know, she, because she is this Nietzschean, she can hardly blame me. She wants me to, she doesn't think I ought to owe anything to her. She thinks we ought to just do what's going to make us happy, you know? And so he writes this letter to her that basically suggests that he can't marry her because he's become a Christian again. He just says, we have a difference in viewpoints. And her response is, she would have respected him if only he had just said, I've fallen in love with someone else. 
tough luck. You know, his happiness, my, your happiness is not my concern. My own happiness is my concern. And this is what's going to give me happiness. But she feels like even in that moment, he can't do the truly self-affirming thing. He has to make it about this um, religious difference. So, uh, so he gets married. He has children. He winds up going back to Copenhagen to try and resurrect his project. He comes back he fails at that. He comes back. He has a blow up with Pastor Blumberg. They get home and he says to her, I think you understand that this was not about one fight, that there has been a difference between us for some time. And she is very understanding. And she says, I'll never go back to see my parents again if you're not welcome in their house, etc. And she, in a very Blumbergian way, says... Yes, you're an unorthodox believer, but, you know, we all have our different paths to God and I respect yours. And he says very explicitly and very abruptly, but I don't believe in God. And she's horrified, but she's, she, she's not just horrified. She does not, she does not believe him. And she thinks the same thing that Jakob had thought, which is there's another woman. And what she thinks has happened is, well, he was back in Copenhagen. He saw Jakob and now he wants to. So she, she says, that, that's not what it is. You don't even have the courage to tell me the truth, which is that you've fallen in love with someone else. And in this very Kierkegaardian way, he realizes that the he thinks right thing to do is to tell her, yes, I've fallen in love with someone else. So she can in good conscience end the marriage and find happiness somewhere else. And then we get to the last 20 pages of the book. So, so his turn yeah. to Christianity has been unturned. He goes off to the, there's a job as a local road inspector. Well, in hold, the, hold up, hold up for one yeah. second. Cause I just want to, I, I just want to dwell on his leaving his family yes. <laughs> for just a minute because that really, that really got to me. Right. Um, I mean, I just think generally when men lie to their wives and leave their families, I get extremely agitated. <laughs> um, and, but this case really bothered me because it was done in the name of self-sacrifice Right. Like I am really, you know, getting on this cross for you, honey, and the kids. And it's like, wait, yes. what? Like, how is it a sacrifice for you to abandon your family? Like something's off about that to me. Right. Just wondering what you. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. And I don't think that. um uh We're meant to think that he's a, a sort of like avatar of authentic living or moral uprightness in his own mind, you know, getting back to what we talked about at the very beginning, I think he thinks she has a moment where she says to him, you know, you should be a little nicer to the kids basically yes. and involve yes. yourself with that. And, and she's he, so gentle about it. She's she such is. a good wife. She, she <laughs> ridiculous. is. She is. She is. And even again, even when he said and and he he has he obviously has depression and he goes through these bouts of melancholy and she's very understanding about it. She is willing to move to the provinces where he'll be the road inspector. She is willing to move to Copenhagen, even though she's very much a small town kind of girl. She she yeah, she is impeccable. I think it, it, she is if there is a, a truly sort of impeccable uh, character in the novel, she is it. Um, yeah. He he decides that his troll nature um, is going to make him be the same kind of father to his son that his father was to him, and that he is going to sort of continue the continue the chain basically, and that. That's part of why he thinks of what he's doing as a sacrifice. Yeah, I'm going to sacrifice yeah. myself and let them have the happy family life they would have without me. I mean, this is I, I, there's a number of characters who commit suicide in this uh, in this novel, and Per is not one of them. But this this is the thought process of the suicide. Yeah, exactly. Right? They would all exactly. they would all these people who love me would be better off without me. Yes, and it's so it it like it it makes me so angry because it's, it's just, 
it's like on the one hand, you can understand how people sell themselves on this, um, on this self image, on this read of the situation, but it really is just a choice they're making to right. stop loving these people. If they ever really loved them to right. begin with, they're actually just choosing to give up and stop because it's hard, because it's not really working out the way you thought. Because you have all these anxieties and worries like anyone who loves anyone does. But it's just this choice. And then when it's dressed up as, no, honey, it's for your sake that I'm right. leaving you. It right. just it, it just makes me so angry. Like at this point, I was like ready to, to kill to kill him. Yeah. I'm, just like, I'm just like, yeah. dude, I'm so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. your journey is really irritating me at this point. Because <laughs> all along in this novel, you know, I sort of had this love-hate thing for Pear because uh, it's like on the one hand, I, I totally get what he's doing and I totally get um, how he ends up with this vision of things and, and his whole struggle is very human and understandable and it's modern and it's relatable and parts of it even track my own life but at the end of the day it's like you just want to smack him yes <laughs> and yes be like, i think there are, there are many like, times actually actually what your problem is you're incapable of loving anyone besides yourself and and i just wish at some point anyone would just smack you in the face and show you this yeah and Jakob tries to smack him in the face in that way a little bit um she tries to to i think love him in in a way that would force him into that realization and i think now i'm blanking on his actual wife's name but i think she also oh i think uh, it's anger or something anger yeah yeah. Yeah. anger does also um but no i think that's i think that's right um but it's also just it's a very in just like a formalistic way it's a very strange thing to do with a novel of this sort you know for the it, it it's it's one kind of novel for 350 pages or something like that. And then it's another kind of novel for 200 pages. And then it's a completely different novel for the last 50 pages. Yeah, um, I mean, which, clearly, clearly, though, it's not an accident, right? And so, No, I think it's brilliant. I think it's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. So, okay, well, here's a theory, and then you can tell me why you think it's this way. But, but I mean, like, one thing that strikes me is that... You know, like part of what's going on with Pear all along is he doesn't really know who he is. It's like he stripped himself of any constraints on his identity besides like this self-creative act. But it turns out he like doesn't really know <laughs> what he's right. doing or what he wants to create or who he is. He's like this massive mystery and puzzle to himself and he's kind of led here and then he's led there and he's constantly undermining himself I think without really understanding why I mean isn't what happens at the end is sort of like he tries another way I mean it's like all along he's trying a different yes. way he tries another way and that happens to be the last way and, and in certain uh respects that's the last way only because it happens to be the last way it's not necessarily yeah. the right way that he's right. that he's landed upon and he dies and 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 he dies relatively young i think he's probably like in his 40s and there's been this weird thing about his health in certain ways he's very robust but he has these sort of spells and i think there's some suggestion that he may have all along had cancer that was growing in him until because it takes his life when he's in his sort of late 40s so his last right. period it's not a long it's not like then he lived out for 20 years it's like maybe like 10 and there's i i want to i know we don't have a ton of time and i want to say about this ending first of all that i that i cried when i uh was finishing this novel the first time i read it a few months ago and then i turned around and reread the book when I knew we were going to be discussing it. And this time I read it and I was doing a lot of underlining. I was thinking a lot of the smart things I was going to say to impress you and your <laughs> listeners. And I was being kind of analytical. Yeah. And then I got to the end and I started crying again. Yeah. All over, over again. And it's, it's 
difficult to really describe what is so powerful about this, but he goes off. He says he's going to go off, uh, and his wife kind of agrees to this divorce. And then we then we jump to the future, to after he's dead, and this local school teacher who goes to start reading, who he's become friends with in this last stage of his life, who is uh, going to who starts reading through his notebooks and and he writes this he reads para writes this and it's 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 impossible to imagine the para at the beginning of the novel writing something like this who is completely so there is a pro, there is a a kind of building that has gone on here he says when we are young we make immoderate demands on those powers that steer existence we want them to reveal themselves to us the mysterious veil under which we have to live offends us. We demand to be able to control and correct the great world machinery. When we get a little older in our impatience, we cast our eye over mankind and its history to try to find at last a coherence in laws, a progressive development. In short, we seek a meaning to life, an aim for our struggles and suffering. But one day we are stopped by a voice from the depths of our being, a ghostly voice that asks, who are you? From then on, we hear no other question. From that moment, our own true self becomes the great sphinx whose riddle we try to solve. Yeah. And it's incredibly powerful. Now, is it true, <laughs> you know, that ultimately like a life in which you abandon the people who love you and for whom you are responsible in order to try and acquire this modicum of self-knowledge that that is the good life? Is it true? You know, no. I would say no. no it's absolutely <laughs> but, not true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what's so fascinating to me, of course, it is true that you want to have self-knowledge. And that you should try to have self-knowledge. But the idea that you can get it on your own by working hard is ridiculous. And it's interesting that he got himself into that place where he thinks he can just, like maybe if he has enough solitude, maybe if he has enough. If he reads the right books. Yeah, enough earnestness and the endeavor. And I think think that's a fantasy. Um, I think that it is very difficult to know ourselves. And of course, there are things we can do. But at the end of the day, as in all things, actually, we need other people. Yeah. Um, We need other people to be complete. And I think that's what what he's missing, what he never somehow figured out is that his full potential as a human person isn't realized by himself. And the problem isn't, I mean, so James Woods's um, piece on this, like most of his pieces, I mean, I have so much respect for him, but we come from such different perspectives that I find I almost always disagree with him. And I certainly disagreed with this piece because he lands with, you know, oh, well, Pear, I mean, at the end, he's just pathetic. And, and, and it's really Jacob is the heroine of the story. And She's really, you know, look at her and her good works and she is amazing and and look at Pear like alone and sad and um and I think that's I think that's not right. I don't think she's a heroine any more than he's a hero. I don't think there are any heroes in this. Yeah, I also don't think that a novel like this, and it's interesting that that Wood goes in that direction as a, an otherwise very sensitive critic, is meant to be didactic in some simple way there isn't a life that you point to in the book and say oh that person figured out what the good life is that person figured out what happiness truly entails you know there's a very interesting moment in the book where 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 pear who again has been is very sheltered and uncultured reads plato he reads, I think, the Fido, and, he, and, and it's horrifying to him. And what's horrifying to him is to understand that what he understood as the negation of the phenomenal world that Christianity introduced, this sickness, that it pre-existed Christianity. Yeah, um, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, again, there's that Nietzschean, like, uh, Christianity is Platonism for the people, but he starts to understand is this this dividedness, this lack of at-homeness, this is a human condition. 
Yeah. This is not a problem Christianity introduced. And and that's and I, I think that's the 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 tragedy of Perrin and, and, and why I found the end so moving is that is that he doesn't ever find a home. It is not that at the end of the book he has found the home in this isolation and self reflection, you know. Um his he remains restless throughout. Um and but but he has at least taken the step of understanding the depths of the problem, I think, and understanding why some of the solutions that were being promulgated in this moment by the Dr. Nathans of the world are not are not sufficient. Yeah, I mean, so I was incredibly struck by that ending. And like I said, I really just want to read this again. Um, so that I can like put all the pieces together in a better way than I've managed now. But one thing that really jumped out to me was that I thought he, I I mentioned this earlier, I thought he ended up a lot like his father. Um, you know, so his father, we didn't talk about it. His father kind of puts this curse on him (laughs) in the beginning. Like he does something that he's going to, he's going to wander the earth like Cain. Yeah. That he's going to be homeless, a a a fugitive of the earth. And that does kind of become true in the end. But, but what really interested me, so this is like way in the beginning, this is page seven. I don't know. He's like describing his family. So it says the overwhelming majority of this family had been pious champions of the church. Many of them widely read as well, even learned theological seekers who in their rustic seclusion had beneath the gray monotony of the years sought recompense for all their hardships in a quiet introspective life of the mind and absorption in their own inner world where they at last found the true value of existence, its richest happiness, its real goal, right? And that's ex- that's almost exactly where he ends up, right? Right. I mean, he ends up this contemplative monk, but without a church, <laughs> right? Without a family, without a town, without a place, and it's so astonishing. And then for Jakob, it's the exact opposite. She's living the active life, right? She's out there. She's a do-gooder, right? She's she founds a, a a school for refugee children, and that's what she spends her. Uh, wealth on, and that's obviously very connected to that experience of seeing these German refugees. Yeah, and so, I mean, it's kind of interesting to me how they end up in these very different places, but it's also interesting to me that this thing that he was so desperate to do all along, which was to escape his family, he doesn't manage it. Yes. He doesn't manage it, and I'm not really sure what to make of it yet, but it's just so striking to me. There's also this amazing line in the last few pages where they're just, uh, it's the people reflecting after Paris died of cancer, of of how he lived based on the notebooks and whatever. And it says um, something to the effect of that the pain was never truly overwhelming could be seen by the fact that he kept a loaded gun on this bedside table. Which is to say, he left himself this out and he never shot himself. There's two characters who shoot themselves in this novel and another character, this pastor who we haven't, we, we could, couldn't even begin to get into, but is actually one of the major figures in the book who hangs himself. And then there's this right. moment yes. where when he's with his mother, they think he's going to, he's going to kill himself and he doesn't. And, and then at the end, he apparently keeps a loaded uh, gun in the bedside table so that at any moment, if he wants to draw things to a close, he can do that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that Morton and I talked about in our episode was like how much Jakobson sort of like sounds like Camus, but like Mm -hmm. couldn't sound like Camus because it because it's like (laughs) obviously almost 60 years prior to Camus. But I mean, you see sort of the same this the, the same things here, not exactly, but similar enough where it's like, well, why not just kill yourself? Right. Yeah. And what what is worth living for if there isn't a naturally ordained telos that's been given to you as a matter of divine providence? You know, if there's not a natural law that gives some constraints, some necessary constraints or boundaries to your self-creation, like who are you in absence of those constraints? And like, I think you can either have a kind of faith that 
this quest for the authentic self and that you're just going to find it is a legitimate faith to have. But I think it's a kind of faith. <laughs> There's certainly not a lot of good evidence for this. Or you can sort of embrace, you know, the idea that there are unchosen constraints on whatever you make of your life and that that's actually good and necessary and a kind of obedience to those constraints right. is like part of whatever whatever is going to be good about your life. But I mean, just what's so like fascinating slash ironic about Pear is that he rejects all these constraints and somehow ends up saddled with this sacred legacy yes. <laughs> of being a Sidonius that he was fighting against all along. So like one of my questions is, well, where's the author trying to leave us? Because he is not a believer, right? No. Just sort of artistically, where is he trying to leave us? I have, I mean, this is a whole other angle to go down when we're, we don't have a time. But one of the things that really fascinates me about this book, and I put it alongside a book like Thomas Mann's, Buddenbrook's, and uh, some of James's late stuff. But it's it's right on the fault line between the 19th century realist tradition and modernism. And uh, it's essentially attempting in the beginning parts to use the realist form, this great 19th century form, to talk about the dissolution of the worldview that that form was, was made to represent. And so that's why the book itself dissolves in this very odd way. You know, I think you can actually sort of see the realist tradition dissolving in this book in the way that you can a book like Buddenbrooks. Yeah. And I think it's possible that Pontobidon thought that, that, that we could, that we could get to some place where these tensions were reconciled uh, and that we we weren't there yet and that it, he happened to be, you know, born at the time of this transition and he still had the Sidenius troll blood that that, that that kept him from living out in the sun. But yeah, but I he, don't he didn't have actually, the master blood after all. No, right? no. Yeah. And, but I don't actually think um, that is where he is. I think he... Um, I think he he's obviously he's 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 not religious but he is obviously a critic in certain ways of like modern rationalist burgeoning sort of you know techno capitalist society for sure the yeah. the sort of obvious um alternative to these two things which would be kind of the artistic decadence are entirely figures of fun in the book you know, he's he even even Dr. Nathan and he was and Pontobidon was 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 friendly with Brandeis. But Dr. Nathan is sort of a figure of uh, fun in the book. He's not that's not taken as a as a serious alternative any more than Bloomberg's liberal progressive Protestant Christianity is. That's the thing is that it is precisely those views that believe that these two things can be reconciled or that believes that the problem isn't as great as people think it is, you know, or that think that like, oh, we have discovered this, the synthesis that can bring us into the future peacefully. Those are precisely the, the, the traditions Pantobidon is the most cutting about. You know, yeah, he's not satirical I mean, about about the conservative pietistic faith, and he's not satirical about the kind of Nietzschean life affirmation. He's critical of them both, but he's not satirical. But these these middle roads that try to synthesize them, those are the ones that he's actually satirical about. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is really interesting to me about this novel and also about Niels Luna is that they're atheistic novels, and I think they're struggling to articulate what a serious atheism would be as opposed to an unserious atheism. And so an unserious atheism, I think for both of them, would just be an unquestioning acceptance of a new faith, <laughs> right, for which there isn't much evidence either. But I think for me what's so interesting is how much any kind of atheism is always an image of a theism, 
and it's sort of unavoidably so, and how much pairs atheism um, ends up being an image of the theism that he was running from for so long. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I just, I think that's a really interesting, I don't know, sort of phenomenon and tension. And, and it was something that, I mean, I used to be an atheist. That's kind of how I was raised. And it was, it was once that I started to see, <laughs> well, first, I didn't actually understand what I was rejecting at all. But second, like that somehow I was like living a mirror image of something that I didn't really understand. Yeah, I, I, I think. Sorry, my, sorry, my earbuds just died. Before we were so rudely interrupted last time by my AirPods dying, uh, we were trying to we're trying to close it out, trying to get yeah. final thoughts, and I can't remember what where we left it. Do you? One thing that I know that I like after the fact wanted to say because we were sort of talking through where we think that Pontobidon comes out on some of these things, and also talking through like woods reading versus other and um the thing i wanted to say i'm not going to get into like mode where this can actually be edited in is the great thing about literature of course is that he doesn't have to answer the question and that we don't have to it, it to the extent that he is answering the questions we don't have to agree with his answers in order to find the work satisfying Right. I do think he concludes in a place that is certainly highly skeptical of rationality and of our ability to, in a kind of uh, secular way, rationally order our lives uh, and, and direct them towards happiness. But he's obviously also very skeptical of religious alternatives to that rational ordering of life. Well, that's like, yeah, so that's really interesting because I know that you've thought a lot about and you've written a lot about Kierkegaard. And obviously Kierkegaard is very skeptical <laughs> about how far reason can take you, or at least he's very like aware of the limits of reason. But he embraces this kind of fideism, right? Where it's right. just like, Absolutely. yeah, faith is absurd, but like, it's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> and yes. so he's sort of like, Maybe coming from that same skepticism, but taking it in a more atheistic direction. Yeah, and this is would come back to, um, you know, uh, you were talking about how Niels Lina um, anticipates Camus in a lot of ways, and of course, what Camus Camus innovation, such as it is, is is to take Kierkegaard's sense of the absurd and to remove that fideism uh, and to remove religious faith. It is not our condition in relationship to God that is absurd. It is our condition that is absurd. Right. And I do think that it may be in that direction that, that Pantobidon is, is trending as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm so interested in this kind of, I don't know, symbiotic relationship that the theist and the atheist are in. And kind of like the respects in which the atheism tends to mirror the theism in certain ways, you know, and, and it just strikes me so much at the end. I mean, I, I already said this, but I didn't say it in relation to his atheism, but there are so many ways in which he ends up like his dad, which is like ironic because, you know, his whole life is in a sense like trying not to be his dad. And it's like, maybe he's faded maybe we're all fated to like end up like our parents, no matter how much we try not to be like them. But his atheism in particular, like this atheistic posture that he embraces at the end, it's every bit as stern and severe as his father's pietism. It just doesn't have God. Yes. And it's, and it's every bit as life negating. Uh, and it is a uh, renunciation. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting because, it in I think one thing that Pontobidon here shares uh, with Nietzsche is that in certain ways, I mean, his great target, and, and this is true, actually true of Kierkegaard too, is 
one, the idea that belief can be placed on some kind of rational footing, which is sort of the the Blomberg, Pastor Blomberg idea, the sort of like progressive rationalist, healthy life affirming faith. That is rejected outright. But what one might consider, the, if, because you talk about atheism being a mirror image, the atheistic mirror image of that rationalist theism, which is the sort of 19th century progressive faith that we can also have a kind of rational, secular worldview where either God in this Hegelian way has become so abstract that it doesn't make any demands that defy our reason, where God can be removed entirely, but we can basically have the equivalent of theistic ethics. You know, we can, reason can, in a, whether it's utilitarian or whatever, that, that we can live according to the dictates of our reason, and that will be a kind of peaceful, happy, life-affirming uh, existence and that the problems of existence can be rationally managed away. That is like, that is as much, I think, a target in this book as any kind of theism is. And certainly is, is I think, more of a target in this book than the more fideistic and uh, severe versions of religion. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Pear doesn't get swept up in like, I don't know, any kind of social movement doesn't ever seem to, I don't know, take up faith and, you know, the progress. No, the social history. movement is a little bit of what ha- what, what happens for, for Yako at the end of the novel when she is running this school yeah. for the refugee children, which has a very strong bent that it's going to be secular education. Yes. And a very, there is a real focus on hygiene in a way that is like very interesting for that moment, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's a sense that probably there's a focus on moral hygiene as well. And this mm-hmm. sort of sense of secular uplift, we're gonna bring these people into the school, we're going to clean them and bathe them and teach them how to live. And they very specifically say also that it's not a boarding school because the idea is that they're supposed to take these values that are inculcated in the school and then bring them into their sort of like backwards home. Yeah. There, there, is, there is definitely a sense of a lot of the progressive views about education that were swirling around uh, at that time. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like, like James Woods, we talked about this, like he sort of sees Jacob as the hero, you know, the one that is the exemplar or something. I'm not sure that that's right. But it is interesting that both of them go into a period of solitude. She goes into a period of solitude after she, um, her baby is stillborn. Well, their baby is stillborn. Yeah. But the fruits of her solitude are that she's going to give back to others through this school. You know, she she sort of has this revelation or this idea that this is what she's going to do with the rest of her life, and she does it. And, you know, Pear's solitude, by contrast, it's not it, – it, sort of, it sort of ends in himself. I mean, yeah. he, he has some kind of job. He's like a road inspector. So like he does he's a, stuff, he is a, but a, a road inspector and 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 actually makes enough of a living uh, in doing that that he dies having saved up in his sort of uh, uh, hermit like lifestyle quite a bit of money, which he leaves to Jacob and to the school. Right, and it's an interesting almost idea of a spiritual economy that goes on there. Right, that is of course like some. That the monastic tradition relies in part on the idea that the people who are secluded in this way are, in fact, contributing productively to the common good. Mm-hmm. And and that is, in a certain way, kind of like literalized with this. He, he His money then winds up going to Jacob and to her project. And, and in this odd way, they, they, they do get um, united at the end. I think I already mentioned this before, but there is a great moment where, because his older brother, who Jacob has had this very unpleasant encounter with earlier, and he's tried to talk her out of the engagement because she's Jewish, and they're horrified at the idea of him marrying a Jew. And then obviously, 
it hasn't ended well. So it's the brother's job to go tell Jacob that her school has gotten this inheritance. And he says, well, I, you know, I, I, I basically, I warned you that this couldn't end well. And she says, um, on the contrary, hair was like one of the great pieces of luck in my life. Right. Yeah. I guess I would just, I mean, I guess this is my final question. Is Pear happy in the end? I mean, what, you know, the whole No, time... I don't think so. But I, I, I do think that um, what he, and, and, and we haven't even talked about, and I don't think we, we like, we'll have time to talk about this other pastor who he becomes close with towards the end of the book, who is kind of living in solitude and first puts the question to him of whether being happy is actually the thing that we're here to do. And and I do I do think that that, that Pear arrives at an an almost like proto existentialist view that like the greatest good for him is somehow to know himself and then to live that knowledge authentically. And that that won't necessarily uh, result in happiness, but happiness is not itself the greatest good. I mean, this is, you you know all this stuff very well as a philosopher, but I happen to be reading um, a lot of this tradition right now. And, and, you know, one of the, obviously, in the effort, you know, during this sort of period, 18th and 19th century period of secularization to come up with some sense of secular ethics, there just was a very clear sense that happiness was individual human happiness was the only possible coherent standard for the good. And that is not just in the utilitarians, but going back to Locke, who says empirically, the the simple idea we have that is the idea of the good is our own pleasure, is is our right. own immediate experience of pleasure, and that any other ground for the good is just incoherent because all knowledge comes from experience and that's what we have experience of these are uh, these you know abstract platonic ideas of the good that's not something we could possibly experience and so happiness and the pursuit of happiness is almost definitionally the good yeah i mean i think that's a very debased conception of happiness very far from eudaimonia or beatitude but yeah, I mean it's what, you know, it's what happens when you embrace a kind of vulgar empiricism and you know, it's all it's in a way it's it's what you can have. So it's what you hope for. Right. Yeah, but um and so I think that if that's what happiness ends up being, then people should reject it, right? I mean, that's not Yeah. right. And that's that 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 certainly is a view of happiness that I think this book is pushing up against as much yeah. as it is pushing up against the theistic tradition that Pear is, you know, born into and the the, um, the born Sidenuses of the world. Yeah. I mean, I think he's not wrong to want self-knowledge. He's not wrong to to think that that's not just a worthy goal, but like somehow essential, you know, I mean, that's in Plato, <laughs> right? Right. He's, he's wrong perhaps to think that, that you can, you can get that outside of the context of your relationship to other people. That the yeah, way that I mean, one arrives at that knowledge is through, um, you know, removing yourself from these connections to other people and your responsibilities to other people and the demands of uh, something larger than yourself. Yeah. I mean, what drops out. So for him, self-knowledge is cut off from self-transcendence. I mean, and that seems to be the problem. And that seems to be the problem with his solitude as well, is that while it might, while it may have borne material fruits that go back to the common good, it doesn't seem spiritually to have gone back out in any meaningful sense. And, you know, the thing that's so sad to me about the end of this book is just, you know, it's not, it's not just that he became his dad on 
don't really think he did. He became a, a version of his dad. But also that he just didn't have anyone to love in the end. Yeah. I mean, obviously, one candidate for this self-transcendence could have been his Grand Canal project right it is that it's a very you know worldly um means of self-transcendence but it's it's certainly a project larger than himself and this idea that it was going to bring about this change to the society and to denmark's place in the in in europe etc cetera, etc cetera. but he doesn't love the project for itself he loves the project for his personal aggrandizement which is why every time that he's asked to humble himself for the sake of the project he can't do it right and so that sort of reveals the reality that it's not about the project it's about uh it's about himself right right and it's sad i mean ultimately it's 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 i think leaves you in a in a sad a sad place okay well i see that your toddler has yeah. broken into the room uh it's time which for is terrific party. Yeah. She's, she's ready for dad and I don't yeah. blame her. My toddler is downstairs screaming. So I think we got to close it out. Um, I really can't thank you enough for being on the show. I'm so grateful. And, it, and it I really can't thank you enough for making me read this novel, which I never would have read in the middle of the semester because it's like 600 pages long, Yeah, <laughs> but it was wonderful. Thank you. That's great. I hope that more people will find out about it by way of the podcast. People should, you know, we need to bring about a revival of Danish literature because yeah. that stuff is amazing and not enough. We're going to have it. to get Morton to teach us both Danish if we're going to be. <laughs> I'm trying to learn Hebrew, like yeah, I think, so <laughs> which is okay. killing me. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to my teacher, Ari Lam. Okay. All right. We got to go. Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast that is generously underwritten by the Institute of Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and produced by Catholics for Hire, a group of young Catholic digital content freelancers. Special thanks goes to my editor, Anthony Monson, for all that he does to keep this podcast running. If you enjoy this podcast, and quite generally want to support liberal learning for life, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can go to www.patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod to become a monthly patron for as little as $2 per month. And I'd like to thank our most recent patrons for their support. Thanks goes to Thomas Lippert, Eric, Timothy Bostic, Robert Turner, Marion Bodeju, Brian Sivy, Derek Barksdale, David Van Vickel, Amber Lapp, Catherine, Bob, and Alex. And also, please don't forget to give us a positive review on iTunes. That helps us curry favor with our algorithmic overlords. And you can also, of course, tell your friends and family that they should definitely check us out and they can find us online at sacredandprofanelove.com. For our next episode, I will be joined by Zena Hitz and Chad Wellman to discuss the burning question, are the humanities in crisis? Until then, friends, be well and keep reading.